Welcome. Good afternoon. So as, as you know, uh, today we have a fantastic guest lecturer in the course Service Oriented Design. Uh, I'm very happy to have here uh, Jan Villa Lammers. Uh, we know each other since uh, over a decade. Uh, he was uh, with the Wemware, one of the initial partners of the Green Lab. Uh, and uh, so it exists since uh, about 12 years. And, uh, and uh, today is accepted to give this le guest lecture on, on the challenges and how they approach that in, in Wemware. Uh, Jan Willem is uh, a lead uh, uh, CTO for Wemware. And uh, I think I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, glad to be here. Um, second time so like first time was in the in the green lab in the early days uh i've been helping also one of uh, patricia students uh, on the master thesis uh, uh, in in some past so we did we have some history um and uh so i'm very happy to be here and uh, present to you today and maybe have some discussion so if you have a question uh, yell shout put a hand up or throw something soft at me uh then we uh we can have a discussion, um, but we have a long history, but uh, Patricia and I also have a short history. Um, and that history is for today. Technology always hurts you. So this was this morning. We were in uh, The Hague together. Uh, anybody knows who this person is in the picture? No, not the right answer. Warm, but no cigar. Who's the person in this picture? It's a minister, so that's good. Which one is it? Well, I'm not teasing you any longer. This is Mickey Adriansen. She is the Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate. So she's responsible for uh, interaction with the businesses, but also for the climate policy and everything that goes with it. Also the energy. Uh, so there's Rob Jetten, for example, the Minister of Energy is a colleague in the same department. Maybe more famous because he's, uh, he, he's more often on TV than she is. But uh, So this was today and what we did, we uh, handed over the manifest of uh, sustainable uh, digitization, which is uh, something we uh, built together with a consortium of I think over 70. 70 parties, Patricia had a big role in it in, uh, in making this happen. Uh, and you can tell who has the biggest role and who hasn't in the next picture. Um, because here is the minister and here's Patricia. And here I am. <laughs> so that's uh, to put everything in perspective, literally with this picture, I think is, uh, is a great uh, view to see uh, what, uh, how the priorities are, so that's good. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about is um, uh, VMware. I don't know if everybody knows VMware, but it's not the importance of today if you know what VMware is. Um, VMware is a software company. We are since 98, started as a pop and mom shop uh, doing virtualization on the x86 processor. And nowadays we are a, uh, 35,000 people worldwide, um, pretty big, doing around 12 to 14 billion uh, dollars in revenue every year in software. So we are pretty big and uh, in IT, most people know us, uh, in the consumer market, not so much, uh, unless you use uh, Fusion or Workstation on your, uh, your own machine, then you might, might know it. But people who use Parallels, they don't know us. <clears throat> so virtualization, that's what we've been, uh, been doing for the last time, and we extended it to lots of other stuff that we're going to see later on. And in essence, with virtualization, you can consolidate virtual machines onto less physical hardware, so you save IT equipment. And with saving IT equipment, you're saving also uh, power. Uh, and of course, with uh, saving power, you're uh, also having less carbon footprint, you have less emissions. 
and it, it goes in two folds. There's infrastructure and non, uh, there's data center and infrastructure stuff because um, if you have less equipment to power, you also have less cooling and other stuff in the data center that goes on. And if you fast forward it, and if you accumulate this uh, over the years, so this report was built uh, till 2019, and then we measured that we have avoided 1.2 billion metric tons of carbon emission since 2003, when we started to actually be able to measure something uh, significant there. Um, by now, if you follow this graph, it should be over uh, 2 billion that's been avoided in carbon emissions by using virtualization. So reducing the footprint of data centers, less servers, less storage, less equipment, less networks, less everything, and being able to do uh, more with less. That's the basic thing. And why did VMware grow so fast? Because a lot of changes uh, in history went, went over a longer period. And you see that VMware did change very fast. That's because a lot of advantages were combined at the same time. Normally you have faster, uh, better and cheaper. You can pick two or three. Uh, with VMware, you had faster, uh, better and more reliable in the same part. So you had reliable, you had standardization, you had cost savings. So you had a lot of advantages without any real disadvantages. And that's why virtualization is now became the standard in every data center and every cloud infrastructure that we see. So looking at software, what happens in software, um, there's a lot going on. And in the, uh, the pre-discussion I had with Patricia, I uh, heard that you discussed this topic already before in another lecture, uh, but it, it, it grasped my attention. Um, that Bitcoin, uh, a single uh, cryptocurrency is now using so much energy that it's similar to, uh, to, to the environmental damage of using beef or, for the entire world. So it's, it's crazy. Um, so what happens there is this graph, you see the uh, megawatt hours per coin that is growing exponentially uh, over the last period. Uh, it's getting crazy and it's getting out of hand. It's getting uncontrollable. <clears throat> and I think uh, there's some figures, some say Belgium, some say Netherlands. If you look at a, the energy usage of a country, that's the same as what, uh, what Bitcoin is currently doing. So in software, we always have other ways to look at things. So that's a cool thing. We can have so many options. So there's other ways to do so. And if you start at the right, there's the Ethereum example that they changed the uh, consensus algorithm because a blockchain uh, exists by a consensus algorithm to who decides uh, what the truth is and have a, a quorum, have a majority vote in that. Uh, and that's been done in uh, Bitcoin by proof of work. So it's, we all start calculating at the same time and who's there the quickest wins and gets the money and all the other energy is wasted. In uh, Ethereum, Ethereum now changed to proof of stake, which is a different consensus algorithm, which claims to be 99.9 less uh, energy intensive. So that's a huge step forward. Um, still the question is there, how valuable is uh, a cryptocurrency for society? But that's not something we're gonna solve here today. But I want to take your attention also to the left part of this slide. And on the left part, you see the architecture of the algorithm of something that we developed at VMware over the years. And it's called scalable Byzantine fault tolerance. It's also a consensus algorithm, but the difference is this one cannot be used easily in public networks. It can only be used in private or in, in closed community networks. So when you have a consortium of people that want to use a blockchain together to share information or have a common truth of things. There's a way to, to do that. Um, it's been using now in production, for example, in the Australian uh, stock market. If anybody has, has ever traded stock, when you do, you do it, it takes one, two days before it's settled and everything's done and processed, the post-trade settlements. So that's now we're done with new systems and those systems do that lightning fast and they use blockchain technology for that. And the uh, VMware technology, the Byzantine fault tolerance um, has been used for that. There's a research paper where you can see all the details on how it exactly works, all the mathematical cool stuff that's in there. 
And interestingly enough, uh, the people who uh, figured this out, when they, when they figured it out and they were done, most of the researchers left VMware and they went to Facebook to start the Libra uh, cryptocurrency, which failed, crashed and burned. But the, 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 the algorithm is still there. It's very valuable. It's been using more and more. It's starting now in financial markets, but there's lots of other use cases that we have discussions now on. Well. So blockchain, I think, is a very valuable thing of sharing information and doing it, but you only can do that when you can do that in a sustainable way. And that's why we invented or researched and built and figured out a way for Byzantine for tolerance. Anyone know where the Byzantine part comes from? Anyone heard that word before? It's a warfare term. It's something from the time of Napoleon. Uh, when you send a courier with a message through a battlefield and the courier reaches the other side of the battlefield and gives you the message, you're not sure if you can trust that message since he's been through the battlefield. So nobody knows what happened. So the trick there is to send an uneven number of enough couriers around different parts around and through the battlefield and then compare all the messages that you have. And then if you have an uneven quorum, that message is most likely or highly likely true. That's the basis on which the Byzantine fault tolerance uh, method of VMware works as well. Um, it uses uh, a majority majority vote, uh, so it so it can start only with three notes already. When you can have a working system that's reliable, so you can make it as small as you want, and you can scale it to as big as needed is for the participants or the latency or uh, whatever use cases you want to do. So, uh, so you only need as little equipment as possible to uh, make it work. So we had the working prototypes in three Docker containers. That's doing the entire thing. All right. So then on to VMware and why sustainability is such a big thing, because it's part of our ESG, uh, the environmental, the social and government uh, governance part of how we operate our business. And it's becoming more and more a license to sell for us. We now have customers that are asking us about our ESG goals, strategy, achievements, reporting, everything, to decide if they want to buy a product or a service from us. So it's that important nowadays to do that. And I think it's, we're on a good track to keep each other responsible in the entire chain, in the supply chain of what we're doing in businesses to do that. So looking at delivering services and also cloud services, that's becoming more and more important. So I think for you, it's also important to keep that in mind because that's where your future is. That's where you can make the difference for the companies having this in mind, having this background in sustainability to do the right things when services are delivered. So here you see the history of what we've done. Um, so uh, if you look at the carbon neutral we did that in 2019, then we were done with that. That was uh, uh, our own operations, to make our own corporations carbon neutral, our own data centers carbon neutral, uh, everything we do. Um, the 1.2 billion we discussed already, there was the research on what our collective customers have been saving and avoiding over time with the use of the software. And we have the 2030 agenda, I'm gonna discuss that a bit more. And this is what I just mentioned, the responsible sourcing program is something that we have now to make sure that we have the answers to the questions we're getting from our customers to be able to keep continuing doing business with them. Because if you don't have that in place, um, you're likely gonna be going out of business uh, anytime soon. So it's, um, it's not a matter of uh, optional, it's uh, mandatory. So the 2030 agenda, I'm not going to do everything on this, but I'm going to focus on a couple of points. 30 goals, which you want to achieve by 2030. Uh, sustainability, equity, and trust. So uh, next to sustainability, equity, and trust is important for us. Uh, making sure we also uh, 
do the right things on device diversity and inclusion, uh, everything that we need to do for, for our people, uh, but also the entire culture of VMware. VMware is a very open culture with the intent of leaving the planet behind a bit better than how we found it. If we can change anything about that, we will not stop and, and do that. Uh, the trust part has also a lot of to do with ethics, um, but also security. Cybersecurity is also an area we are active in. It's been threatening the world uh, pretty big at the moment. Question there. Yeah, the Anywhere Workspace, uh, good question. Uh, the Anywhere Workspace as part of equity is the technology that enables people to work where and when and how they want and to be able to combine uh, uh, family life uh, with, with private life. Reason why we're now broadcasting this over Zoom was some people choose to do this lecture from the comfort of their home while others took the effort to come here and, uh, and get a different experience. But that's about choice. Uh, and, and the basis of having choice is important and we deliver a foundation for that. So going on to the um, sustainability goals, which are a bit skewed in this slide, okay. Doesn't really matter. Um, so we discussed the carbon footprint part um, the zero carbon committed partner program, which I'm going to discuss in more detail. And like I said, in 2019, we already uh, reached our internal goals. Um, but that's not the thing, the thing. VMware is in the, in the scheme of things, still a small part. So if we do everything for our own operations, that's a good thing. We give an example, we need to do it and we need to do it to, uh, to, to, to do our part. But the important part comes through our culture, through our people, people like me who stand here and present to you. Um, we get a, a week per year to do something for charity, to do something for a good cause, to do a project somewhere, uh, to uh, plant a tree for every employee. We do all kinds of stuff that we uh, to do to foster the culture of doing well and, and being kind to each other and to the world. Oh, and I forgot, of course, the most important part is the third part. So first, internal, second, people, but third is product. Our products and services should allow our customers to make big savings because that's where the amplifier kicks in. So every 1% that we can do in our product, product amplifies with 300,000 customers and the amount of servers and machines and everything they have. So every 1% that we do has a massive impact uh, all over that. And I think that's also the target that you are looking at in, in, this, uh, in this study, the services, um, how they can make the difference, uh, even with a small thing of the service is broadly used. We had the Hives moment uh, four years ago with a different compiler. We now have the Ethereum example. If you can make a small change or a bigger change on something that's used by a lot of number, uh, high number of people, then you make the biggest change. No, hesitation, not coming. So what does VMware then actually do? Because we said we do virtualization, but that's a oh, question there. Yeah. Uh, I think we work with Ecovadis. Uh, I think we're, that's, that I, I didn't use the entire list of all the certifications we have with all the credit, but um, we have our uh, ESG report, a 64 page document where we put down everything that we do and all everything's because transparency is key in this. And you can say, you can write a greenwash that you have a certificate, but you have to be able to prove it. So uh, I think we work with Ecovadis for this, uh, but uh, I can look it up in the uh, in the ESG report, it's, it's all in there. Anyway. I'll, I'll get to that after two slides. So I'll get, so your questions about the, the, the carbon, uh, the green carbon neutral cloud. Yeah, okay. Well, I can give you a tease already. We didn't do so much. We let our partners do it. 
Um, because that's a funny thing you see on this slide as well. VMware is a large company, but we don't have a lot of uh, IT equipment. We only have IT equipment for our own R&D or some of operations, but all the services that are listed here that we deliver to our customers either run on the infrastructure of our customers or they run on hyperscalers or cloud partners like KPN, uh, Equinix, uh, uh, those companies that have the data centers that have the facilities. So we are, can, we can be seen as the Airbnb of the cloud. You can have all kinds of housing, uh, all kinds of varieties. You can have a full house or a shared room, uh, different price levels, but we don't own the assets. We only deliver the service, the experience, and the access to it, and make sure it's uh, it's available to to our customers. So if you look at, um, let me see if I can. Yeah, where's the arrow? No, that doesn't work. Um, on the top left, the app platform. That's something we do for the uh, application developers. Cloud management is the management of cloud. So for on-premise, private clouds, but also the hyperscalers, uh, the partners, and also edge deployments. The cloud and edge infrastructure itself, that's the bread and butter what we did, the, the virtualization platform, which includes storage virtualization, network virtualization, and also edge deployments, so for smaller uh, remote data centers. Um, we do security networking um, with virtualized networks, so software-defined networks, software-defined wide area networks, all kinds of software, constructs that uh, make it easily to influence and create uh, and uh, provision uh, networks and security uh, stuff as well. We have uh, kinds of security tools in there, but this is not a product pitch. So that's what I'm here for. Um, and the Anywhere workspace, like the questions just came, is a way to use uh, uh, all your applications from anywhere, from any device. Um, and the fun thing is at the bottom, I don't know if you able to see all the logos. Uh, but if you go from left to right, it's private cloud. That's been the heritage and the most used uh, at VMware. The customers are buying our software to install in the data centers. Um, but the same experience is now available on top of AWS, on Azure, on Google Cloud, on IBM Cloud, on Oracle Cloud, on Alibaba Cloud. And there's stuff missing. I don't know why. There's logos missing. I don't know. Um, and there's interesting stuff going on, um, also around uh, sustainability. It's on uh, uh, on edge. So um, who uses Photophone here? One? Oh, that's shy. No, the only one. So you and me. So it's just you and me. So we use VMware every day when we make a call. So the entire network, the entire 5G network of Photophone is built on a VMware software-defined data center. It used to be Ericsson that puts this big thing and then you had, a, had a, 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 an antenna mast that sends it out. And now it's a VMware data center with the software of Ericsson running on top of it as in software. So they can iterate, they can scale it up and down, they can do all the stuff. They can run services, cloud services near the edge. So for example, if a, a gambling uh, 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 application wants to run at an edge location next to a soccer match in a stadium, they can do that. Photophone can offer uh, the, the zero near latency of all the people in the stadium that want to real-time gamble while they're at the game to run their application at the edge of their antenna mast. Well, it's not the most uh, thing that, that's, that's getting a lot of attraction where you change the world with, but it's just an example. So what is changing the world is that this same concept of, of using a small software-defined data center at an edge, we are now using for the energy grids. Everybody knows about energy prices, right? Uh, and net congestion and the stupid things are out there. So we're gonna have some discussion uh, at the end of the session, hopefully on, on these topics. But what I wanna highlight here is that the same thing that we did in the telco market we are now starting to do in the energy market. So at the substation, at the edge of the energy network, where it flows to the houses and the companies, you wanna be able to do real-time steering of the energy. So it's 
then so the Netherlands is not a copper plate anymore with congestion, but you can switch in region, you can deliver uh, energy to your neighbor, do all kinds of smart solutions there. That's something I'm really excited about on the next topic that we can enable that really uh, can bring something for society. So lots of stuff that we do in, in, in services and in cloud services. Sometimes it runs at a hyperscaler cloud, sometimes it runs at an edge, sometimes it runs uh, in the private data center, but the basis is always the same and it's compatible. And that's why we say to customers, yes, you, when you buy VMware, you get an abstraction layer and that abstraction layer gives you an insurance against lock-in because all the cloud providers want you in, in their cloud, in their specific service, which can only deliver by them, which is nice until they change the, the dial on what it costs to you, because then you have nowhere to go or the exit cost is very high. So the cost of exit is easy when you have an extraction layer. And that's what, what we've been doing uh, over the years. Cool. Yeah, like I said, the services. So the application platform, Building and operating cloud native applications. That's what you can do with that. The cloud management, automate and optimize clouds and apps. So there's also measurement there of energy. So we have tools available that can give you the footprint of your IT estate. And then you can start tweaking and optimizing and changing things. We'll get to that in more detail. The cloud infrastructure that we discussed and the rest of it. And the outcome is of course the bottom. It's what it means for our customers. Enable our customers key transformation, grow the business with modern apps, have modern experiences for the users, accelerate the cloud transformation if they want to, to foster the innovation available there, and empower and secure the hybrid workforce to make sure people can work anywhere uh, in a secure fashion. So clouds, we talk about clouds, um, but we all know that the clouds we talk about here, they're not made of air, they're made of cables, data centers, wires, servers, uh, computers, everything. And that's also where the challenge is. And that's what we saw in the past when we did some projects, we saw there's changes and challenges in split incentives. In the cloud services, that's not so much. So because typically in the cloud services, the, the, you, you consume the cloud service, the application on top, and the entire stack is managed by the cloud provider. Bad example is VMware. We do, when we deliver you an application, we do everything until the physical service and storage, because we typically rent them from somewhere else, from AWS, from Microsoft, from Google, uh, from KPN, from Equinix, from whoever, because we are not in the hardware business. We are a software company. So that's where we abstract that away and do it in a different way. Um, but we see that the other way around. What we did in, uh, in one of the projects in Leap uh, we did something around energy settings. And the problem with energy settings is it's in the BIOS of the server. But if you want to enforce it on the end user that's, that's running in the data center, that end user has no access to the BIOS of the server. Or the other way around, uh, when you talk to the uh, data center owner which owns the server, say you have to change that BIOS setting, they said, well, I can't do that because the server is used by a customer of mine and I'm not sure if they want to want that. So the split incentive is, is hard. It's also been between IT teams and data center teams. The energy bill is typically picked up by the data center, by the real estate, uh, why the IT that runs the servers, they don't typically care about the power that's been used in there. So having transparency, having measurement, having showback of uh, real cost or uh, stuff is really important to change the perception and, and do something about the layers that are out there. So the zero carbon clouds, you say, I'm really interested in what you, what you did there. Um, well, it's not as fancy as you think. I'm sorry about that. Um, but what we do there is of course, we uh, address the supply chain. So we ask um, all, the, um, all the data center operates that we consume stuff from ourselves or that we show to our customers that they can consume VMware services from to ensure they use 100% renewable energy sources to power the data centers. And if they do that, they can be part of the uh, zero carbon cloud initiative. Uh, and we show that. So if you look for a cloud provider on the VMware website, you can select what properties you want. And zero carbon is one of the properties 
the main front and central in the selection criteria of what you want to do. We just came from the meeting in Den Haag. KPN was there. KPN is not in the list. When you check them, KPN doesn't show up. I'm sure they do a lot of good stuff. They might have everything done, but they didn't do the paperwork with us yet. So I'm going to engage with them right now to make sure they will get on that list as well. And that way we push the responsibilities through the chain with our partners to make sure they do the right thing as well, because it's a, it's a team sport. We have to do it, every, everybody together in the market to make this thing happen. And then the stuff I just uh, discussed about the LEAP program. The first thing we did in the LEAP program um, was to uh, look at the energy settings of a server. And I know you're in software, but you have to know something about CPUs to know how software runs. Um, and this was a, a, a hidden gem for a lot of people. Um, we won an award with it, so everybody thought it was a good idea. So that's always nice. Um, but the essence there is that a lot of servers, if you go into the BIOS, you can set the settings to maximum performance. Maximum performance means the equal maximum amount of megahertz you can do across all cores in a CPU socket. And we call that the thermal envelope of a processor. Nowadays, we've got multiple cores. But the processor has a thermal envelope. It can only dissipate so many heat uh, uh, until it blows up or, uh, or goes uh, <laughs> go, go do, do strange stuff. The fun thing is if, if you use the energy settings to uh, OS controlled and use the power settings for balanced energy saving, your performance can become higher than it was in maximum performance. So now I'm silent. Who knows the answer? Why is that? Why could an application run faster on a CPU that has the settings change for maximum performance, which has the maximum megahertz for that specified server? And how can it then run faster when you put it in OS controlled, where the virtualization layer or the OS manage it? How can it be faster? Yes. No, the answer is not a bottleneck with, with IO. The bottleneck is the thermal envelope. So if you change that to OS control, then an individual core that runs an individual application can spike much higher in the frequency in megahertz uh, because it's not kept by the maximum performance limit anymore. And as long as the entire socket of the, all the cores are within the thermal envelope of dissipation, you can, you can overclock certain cores uh, for periods of time, have that application run faster with anybody noticing. Of course, you're using more power when you're uh, putting a higher frequency in there, but your application also performs faster. And the total power of the entire chip uh, with all the optimizations are also uh, tuning cores down because they're not used and they can more, do more idle, uh, uh, you can, you'll save a lot of energy. So that's a very smart way of doing that. Uh, another way is also when we, um, as a similar thing, that's also strange magic, people that started with containers, with Docker containers and Kubernetes on bare metal, and then found out that when they virtualized it on top of VMware, the applications ran faster than they ran on bare metal. It was also a mystery for everybody. Reason for that is that the virtualization kernel that we built uh, is so much better at optimization of NUMA, the non-uniform memory access, or the addressing of memory banks relative to the CPU that it processes, is much better at that than the Linux kernel is that the standard Kubernetes use it. It was much more optimized and then run faster. So, Sometimes there's crazy stuff going on in hardware that you don't know about in software. Oh, one more anecdote. Um, who remembers the Spectre and Meltdown? One, one, two, three. It's also a bit of chip history. The fun thing is, um, Pat Gelsinger used to be the CEO of VMware for a long time. 
And Pat Gelsinger was engineer number one on the Pentium 4 processor. Well, you're all too young for to know that. I had one, so that shows my age. The Pentium 4 processor was the first one that have, had the SSE instruction, the speculative execution. So the processor was looking ahead of what the next instructions likely would be, and then made sure it was ready to do that already. And exactly that thing has been misused by uh, cyber criminals to uh, do the spectrum meltdown uh, leaks that, that were addressed and uh, gave a lot of headache in the IT industry. And the fun thing is that when that hit, at the time that spectrum meltdown, I was having a meeting at the NCSC, the National Cyber Security Center. They're hosting a meeting right now in the Hague at the One Conference. I'll be there tomorrow. Um, and I sat there, down there with Hans de Vries, he's the boss of the NCSC, together with Pat Gelsinger. So we had the spectrum meltdown, and then we had Hans de Vries asking Pat Gelsinger, in retrospective, what were you thinking when you invented the Pentium 4 with speculative execution going forward? And then, well, of course, at that time, nobody could have thought that uh, any hacker could misuse that part so deep down in a piece of hardware, uh, which is then exploited to do uh, something uh, on cybersecurity. So even though you're all in software engineering, making sure that you know what the abstractions are to the hardware and the changes are there can give you a long way in your future and you actually know what's going on on there and make a difference because there's still a lot of inventions to do that. All right, physical service and virtualization. So now we have the, the, the bottom layer of the, the cake that we just built. Let's go up a bit higher into the uh, monitoring part because it starts with measuring. Um, so, history lesson again. Rio, one of your students, um, he came up with a thesis on, uh, uh, on uh, attributing the energy usage to applications. And we figured out a way to do that using uh, tools from VMware. Um, and luckily enough, uh, a bit earlier, I made sure that the number of watts a virtual machine consumed is being um, it's being registered in the database of the VMware software as a first class metric. So you can look at the VMware software and you can see how many watts a virtual machine uses over time and it has a sample rate and uh, you can take that information out. I just had a chat with ABN Amaro, they're exactly doing that for the energy carbon dashboards. And I hope that they are gonna be showing that in the climate week in the session I'm gonna setting up with them as well. So fast forward, we built all this and we now have the green dashboards as a functionality in uh, the service that we deliver for measuring. So you can use that, you can install it in data centers, or you can take it as a service from our cloud where you can measure the footprint of green uh, supply of your servers, green demand. It looks at the age of the servers, looks at the idle time, it looks at the consolidation rates and gives you advice on what you can optimize to do so. You can consolidate uh, virtual machines on less servers, or you can do a what if analysis. So what if I replace this four year old server with a new one? Of course, I get a, a, a carbon footprint of uh, 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 recycling that server and buying a new one, but what's the impact on my IT footprint? So we balance that out and we give advice on that to give a footprint. So this is a good way to start to make your uh, zero measurement before you start fiddling with BIOS settings and features, because then you have a baseline and you know what's changed and you can look at the results and reap the advantages immediately. Question. I didn't look at the question. How much spectra and meltdown threats It is not, not a real difference between clouds and virtualization because all clouds use virtualization in there. At the moment, not anymore because we, 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 we know it's there, we fixed it, we made workarounds and patches for it. So we, we changed it, but it's waiting till an, a, a new one appears that nobody knew about. And that's always the challenge. Today is always the challenge in cybersecurity. When something comes out, 
that's there nobody knew about like log 4j that was really uh really destructive because uh it it, it took everybody by surprise the spectrum meltdown we had a advance notice and we could do some workarounds to make sure uh, so we disabled hyperthreading, for example to overcome the problem with spectrum meltdown that gave a big performance hit on the system so it gave less consolidation it uh, it gave a lot of headaches for data center operators but not a real risk of data leakage or uh, or hacks where with log4j it was a totally different story because so many stuff was impacted because of this open source library that's been used broadly by everybody and nobody has seen it uh, that it became a, a, a much bigger issue so so sometimes it's hardware it's back to meltdown that has an impact um, but i think in going forward uh, software uh, is is the, the bigger threat and if you then look into um, going back solutions what we what we do there um, for example in virtual networking what we do in vmware we have distributed firewalls with ids and ips where you can also do virtual patching so when there's a zero day and there's no patch yet uh, when you know the pattern of the threat, you can tell it to the IDS IPS when it recognizes it stops it or it translates the instruction to a different one. So you uh, alleviate the problem there as well. So there's also software problems to come around again. Yeah, it's a cat mouse fight all the time, I think. That's why I'm spending my day tomorrow in The Hague as well. All right, back to measurement. Um, this is what we deliver now as a cloud service to everybody. Uh, a lot of that work came from the ideas that I uh, came up with in the view and I pushed it into product management to to have this and uh, well time and uh, sentiment helped a lot because uh, now everybody thinks this is the coolest thing and, and everybody everybody now is, is, is raving about it so this gives customer transparency reporting and an easy baseline to do something and then when you have from that tool you find that application owners typically say, my application needs 16 virtual CPUs, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and this amount of yada yada, because that's what the specification of the requirement says of the uh, software vendor. But typically, they don't use that all because it's using a fraction. They don't have lot, lot users. So the system sees that. The monitoring system sees that and gives you advice for right sizing. But then you have to go back to the application owner to discuss that right sizing with him. Okay, can we change that? And what we figured out is a fling that uh, people are now using to do that desired state and schedule it. So we say right sizing, okay, we think this one has 16, but it only needs two. So we say, okay, on the next patch installed, and it do this machine does a reboot. On that reboot, we change the virtual hardware and we bring it down to two CPUs. And that way we consolidate even further. We take the slack out of all the virtual machines that are out there to make them run more efficient and more optimized the fun thing is yeah but what if i need more if i need to scale up because taking resources away always needs a reboot the fun thing is with virtualization adding resources the hot add function adding cores adding memory can be done on the fly so when an incident comes in hey my machine has not enough resources you scaled it down but it needs to go up again there's no maintenance window needed anymore you can at that moment it's okay we'll take it back to four to whatever and then it's in effect immediately without the reboot all modern guest kernels support that nowadays hot add hot remove not so much so it's yeah it's working pretty well a lot of customers are happy with it we have good good numbers on uh, actual reductions or um, extension of infrastructure delaying investments delaying expansions doing more with less that's how we started this doing more with less another thing um i haven't discussed that a lot with the patricia but uh, the green software foundation uh, how much awareness there is on uh, in, in your area what they do are you involved have you looked at what they do yeah, so they do a lot. They do a lot of things uh, and it moves in a certain pace, which is not to say I find it a bit slow. <laughs> um, the first thing they publish now is the, uh, the SCI, 
the software carbon intensity specification that's now published that's the first draft now uh, so that's the first basis that we can judge to work on uh, it's looking promising it's a uh, it's a the creating frameworks the creating standards which is a great thing is it's dearly needed uh, it's very important that we get these things so we can compare things and do it in a, a certain way um, vmware is involved we are part of the green software foundation um, i'm in one of the committees uh, more a community on bringing the message out not so much in the in the research part of uh, of, of making the frameworks itself um, but so i think for you guys it's interesting to look at because i think they need more brain power to get make things happen so i encourage you to look at it see if it has something for you as well uh, because i think with a little bit more uh, enth enthusiasm bottom up like you say always because it started as a uh, thing from Accenture, Microsoft, uh, some corporate things that did some greenwashing. It's starting now to come at a tipping point, but they're actually producing something. But I think we now need to see that they can actually make the pace higher to make it uh, make the effort count. So uh, I'm enthusiastic about what it can bring, uh, not yet about it brings right now. So um, challenges. This is my uh, last slide, so I'm nicely on time for the 45 minute, depending on how long the discussion is going to take, because this is quite a discussion. Um, let me take you with me in my brain on this discussion. So who has an energy contract himself? Who has a long term contract? So you're both fucked. <laughs> so yeah, so the energy prices um, is a thing uh, that everybody sees. Um, with the things that's going on in the energy market, you see a sentiment growing very fast. Uh, like uh, the Facebook data center they want to build in Zeewolde, it was a big no, we're not going to do that because um, it's costing too much energy, it's not responsible, and well, Facebook doesn't have the most popular name in doing something that's really so valuable for society. So people said, no, let's not, let's not do that. It's, it's fun, but uh, it's uh, nah, maybe not. But it's actually the first time that the government uh, regulates something so strictly for a certain sector, because only the uh, IT industry. The, so no other industry, uh, we still have uh, ovens, data steel, uh, stuff like that. They're looking to go to hydrogen, uh, uh, power um, but it's much less regulated than than the it industry is right now so but it's a they hit the pause button because they want to get a grip on it because they want to understand what it is uh, because uh, uh, digitization and sustainability and digitization they can go hand in hand you can make much the, the world much greener much more sustainable by using smart digital solutions the reason why people are now sitting at home watching this lecture and not traveling here is also a saving that we made today. So there's lots of examples um, of, uh, of sustainability that can be gained. Um, the thing of uh, sharing platforms, car sharing platforms with an app, it's a, uh, it costs some, some compute power, but it delivers a lot of uh, advantages. So that's, that's our one thing going on. The energy thing is another thing going on because what is so strange is that the uh, price of a kilowatt hour of energy here is determined by the last mile. I heard uh, Minister Adrian say 94% of energy is renewable. That's what she said this morning. Okay, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh yeah. So I didn't fact check it, but she said 94% of the energy is uh, renewable or sustainable. So that means that 6% of the energy is done by gas, I suppose, maybe coal, uh, maybe nuclear. Um, so that's only a couple of percent. But the last mile of the energy grid, so how it works, the energy market, every, uh, every day they figure out the forecast for the next day. They figure out, okay, it's going to be cold. We have this uh, demand from industries. We have this 
predicted amount of uh, we have this events happening and this is the supply we have so much sun so we can expect so much solar power approximately we have so much wind so we can expect so much wind energy so we know how much the gap is that the gas uh, has to produce to to get the uh, grid uh, stabilized balanced so that's the way it works but the price of the entire energy supply is determined by the gas price of the last mile of that substation which is crazy and there's so many systemic failures in the energy system and the energy market at the moment it's mind-blowing so we need to change that so the renewable energy we now are starting to see micro grids and smaller communities where they can share energy uh, within the region i think it's Kippel, they have one as well they have a micro grid so when you have solar panels and you have excess energy you can uh, distribute it and sell it to your neighbor and then you can determine the price which is a fair price so the value is now the real value the value is not something of a system depending on the gas uh, price the value is the value that you see is good and you can only do that in the micro grid. The challenge is we need to do that in the entire grid. So the entire grid needs to open up. The data needs to be open for everybody to see so everybody can, can chip in. And the energy companies need to change because what is an energy company nowadays? An energy company, to my opinion, is a company that uh, has uh, a solar uh, installation, has wind turbines, has maybe a uh, gas, uh, generator but I think an energy company is not someone that has an office with a computer that buys energy and sells energy and takes a profit of it only that's not an energy company that's just a man in the middle we need to cut those out so the system has to change the man in the middle has to be gone and we have to incentivize that we are using energy in region we are generating it in region we are can that we can store it in region so when we don't have the sun uh, that we can use it overnight for batteries from having our uh, electric cars work both ways have all kinds of or uh, salt storage we have all kinds of solutions to figure out that's what we need to invest in and the energy grid has to support that it has to show who has less and we can trade that and we can do that in an equal way in an open way because then we can change it if we go to the 80 20 rule percent of the energy you are generating yourself on the roof of your house or in your garden your, or whatever uh, or in your uh, uh, in your uh, apartment block uh, and you use that and 20 percent you have all left over you sell to your neighbor bring it back to the energy grid or you have not enough you buy it from your neighbor if you take that 80 20 rule and you trans and that do not only to your apartment block or your house but also to your uh, suburb or your city your region your province if you are, are able to do the 80 20 rule it's impossible to do it in the short term we know that it takes 10 20 years to do so but if you do that you only need 0 0.8 percent of the capacity that tenet has tenet delivers the high voltage cables that go everywhere across the country that's built for the centralized system that we have right now 0.8% of the capacity of Tenet is used if you do the 80 20 rule properly. And I think that's also something I want to give to you, next generation, to take these ideas forward and help to really make a, a, a different place where not energy companies are someone who brokers energy from left to right. That's not what it is. So the grid date has to open, the grids cannot handle the load. So if you do that, uh, system you need a grid that can handle that it can can uh, real time switch and balance the grid autonomously and therefore you need smart computers you need systems that are learning machine learning ai modules stuff that does that that learns how the grid works and that runs as a neural network on your energy net and that's what vmware is now on the right part uh, we, what i said in the telco world on vodafone we now want to do that in the energy grid as well to equip every substation uh, with a software defined data center where you can run the smart energy software from siemens general electric adb those parties that are now also capable and operating the grid in a physical way they can take their knowledge put it into software 
and do the same thing to make it in, into the next evolution. And then you have the basis to open up the net. That's it to um, amplify that message. I'm going to be trying to work with a team of students of uh, Avans Hogeschool in Breda to uh, participate in the uh, Transform Hackathon, which is um, um, something that's set up by the, uh, the Ministry of Economics, by Nikki Adriaanse for example, and, and her team. Um, and the outcomes of that will be presented in the Climate Week to Rob Jette, the Minister of Energy, to see if he can help them accelerate the plans in there. Question. Yeah, the storage is the, the big question. So where do you store it? And what do you do with excess energy? Uh, and there's lots of answers. It's, uh, I'm not going to go in all the details. But we need more and smaller, for example, hydrogen uh, generation stations. So you have excess energy. You can change it into hydrogen. Yes, you lose, uh, uh, you lose energy by doing it. But you better lose it by putting something you can store and reuse than losing it altogether. Yes, the system will control uh, the balancing of that grid and make the intelligent decisions of where stuff goes. So yeah, that's uh, what you want to do. And also the example of uh, an electric car. We now have two-way chargers. So you can charge in, in daylight, you can charge your electric car by full. It's got a huge battery. Um, it's getting bigger and bigger. Then in the night, when you, want to have your, uh, when you have a modern system that powers that uh, warms your house with electricity with a uh, with a uh, warmth pump, yeah, heat pump. Um, you can use that battery from your car to power your house grid, not use something from from the external grid, and then um, set a limit on that. So it can only use half of the. It, so the car always has to be charged half. So the next day you can depart and go somewhere if you want to, or if you connect it to your agenda, your calendar, you say, okay, I need, I have an appointment. I need to go and I need to leave at two o'clock and the system knows that, then it can uh, maybe deplete it more to 20% and then charge it in the morning. So it's ready at two o'clock when you leave again to go to your appointment. So those things need to be integrated and be, become transparent to make sure we can, we can do all that. No, we, we, we will. We are modest. We only provide the infrastructure that enables that. We will not uh, build the system or be owner of the data or have the ambition to do so because we're not equipped for that. So that always has to be uh, an open system. And that's where, uh, again, uh, blockchains might be interesting in sharing open data. <laughs> it's not your favorite example. It could be. It could be. It's uh, Sometimes still a, a solution looking for a problem, uh, but it could be. Um, but there's there's ways to, ways to do that. Which brings me to the final point, and that's a question to you because I don't have the answer. My final point is: I looked up yesterday in preparation for this lecture, I looked up the trend of energy prices in the United States, and I was mind blown. They are complaining about the price for the fuel for their cars. But if I look at the price of energy of the kilowatt hour price uh, over time and how, mu how much it uh, increased, it's, it's a bit, it's just a, a glitch of going up. So 10% uh, maybe. Where here we look at 400%, I don't know, crazy figures. What will this do to the cloud services market? Will it become a new divide? We already had the data divide between Europe and, and the US with the Data Act and the Cloud Act and everything that we are figuring out. And that's why we, I didn't figure it, but I put sovereign clouds in my presentation as well, which is also a way of doing cloud computing that we are engaged in. But we are now seeing a new one arising. We see energy divide. All the cloud providers already had differentiated pricing in the US region and the Europe region. What I foresee is that the Europe region will become so much more expensive because of the energy prices here compared to the US. I don't know how they do it, how they regulate 
the energy market there. Maybe the market's not functioning. That's why the trend keeps flat. Uh, but the, the, the market here functions, but it functions a bit too well. So that's quite a question to you. What do you think that will happen with the cloud market in comparison to the United States and Europe with the changes that are going on right now in uh, energy? Will this drive sustainability? Because now customers will get the question, hmm, I can buy a cheaper cloud service in the US, might not be uh, using renewable energy, might not be as clean as the Europe version, but I'm not going to pay twice the price of it. So I either have, have to, so now I have the not the end, I now get the or. It used to be end. We have uh, a, a good price and we are sustainable. But we are looking to a disaster in moving to or. But people have to choose between the cheap option or the sustainable option, which can't be true. So I need your help with that. How are we going to fix this? Also, the, gra yeah, the data gravity, the, the, the gravity of your data moving stuff from, from A to B is also taking a big tax and also uh, charges because going, putting data in a cloud is typically not so expensive. Getting data out of a cloud, uh, funnily enough, is quite expensive. It's a business model and it has a purpose. Yeah, yeah, that's been done already. The, the heat produced by servers, you say. Yeah, so uh, warmte nette, eh? so here also in Amsterdam, I uh, invest, they, they, I think they're doing that. They, they are um, using the excess heat from the data center to, uh, to heat homes. But what do you do in summer? Is it, yeah, so the question is, uh, is the, like, like you said, in, in Windows, there's a low power? Yeah, yeah, so, we, so, so step down, clock down. Yeah, so that's, like I said in the first example, the, the BIOS and the settings, it's already, that's what you do that in the data centers already. The, the, the data centers, the, the servers step down, they clock down, if not enough uh, work is there. So that's already been done. The challenge is, uh, uh, so you can have excess energy from solar panels that you don't know what to do with. But the same goes with the heat from the data center. If it's summer, the things are still producing heat. Um, the houses don't need to be warmed because they are warm enough already in summer. So what do you do with the heat? Because that heat is still energy. But that again goes to the same thing. So if you have uh, different ways to do that, and for example, uh, hydrogen, uh, could be an answer there because the same hydrogen installation that can use the excess heat from the data center can also use the excess solar power uh, from uh, rooftops. Yeah, with a hydrogen plant, but people are now thinking big. I think we need to think small. We need to start in, uh, we need to think in region because if we think in region, then also the reliability of the grid becomes a totally different story because then you don't have the central uh, idea. And then when, a, when a, a brownout appears, you have a huge disaster. Now, when something goes wrong in, in, a, in a grid, it only affects a, a, a segment, a small part, which can be dynamically switched by these smart software solutions that we are modernizing the grid with. So we, we have to think smaller. We have to go back to the basics of the wind blowing through my hair when I'm standing next to my home. What can I do with it? The sun that's up there. We are now building um, uh, Weilanden, so the, the, the farmers' areas. We're putting solar panels in it. Um, 
well, because uh, we don't want to want to have that many cows anymore, so do we have the land anyway? Um, and and it's, it gives solar energy, but the challenge is with the energy uh, grid currently is when you put a large solar plant in one place, it's hard to connect it to the grid because it gives a, a capacity problem there. In 20, in 20 years, all these solar panels uh, that are out in the farmer's area, they will be obsolete in 20 years. They will have their technical lifespan also finished by 20 years. So then we have to see how we recycle them. But in 20 years, the solar uh, technology will be so much evolved that only solar on housings, on buildings, will be enough to capture energy that we need in the area where we want to use it. So we are going to changing stations. The yeah, solar is, is unstable. So that's why we need, uh, so that, that's why we don't need one solution. We need all the solutions to work together in a smart way to balance because you need some uh, energy sources that you can, that you can toggle up and down like we do now with the gas plants that do the last mile of our, of our expensive kilowatt hour. We need to figure out a smarter way to do the, the throttle in a smaller area to do that. Yeah, look, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity in low power uh, uh, for data centers uh, still as well. Um, if you look at what we do at VMware, we do two ways. So for Edge, we have, have an ARM strategy. So we can also deliver the hypervised platform on ARM for Edge locations that are smaller and have a smaller footprint. Um, and we use ARM now on, um, we call it DPUs, data processing units. It's a smart NIC with a GPU on it that uses ARM that we can also run uh, sub processes on for security, for data transfer, to put that out of the main CPU, to relieve the main CPU from extra cycles and do more work with that. So there's lots of ways uh, to do that. The challenge with ARM is it's a different instruction set. Uh, uh, so the software needs to be able to, to run into it. But well, we all have examples of ARM in our pocket. So it's been able to work. You have a question, Patricia? When I have a microphone? Or shall I repeat the question? So now we need to wait 20 seconds. Shall I tell, shall I tell a joke then? <laughs> uh, no, that's, uh, it's not an appropriate joke that I have in mind, so I'm sorry. Yes. You're there. Oh, from software, from a software engineer. Give your opinion. So one challenge is uh, uh, all points to dynamicity, to flexibility. One is profile in the cloud-based application. Effective use of uh, disaggregated computing resource is like, so, to make the application more energy efficient uh, as well as uh, top quality. And uh, the second challenge is uh, to redesign the applications in order to, uh, for instance, make use of uh, be being deployed uh, where energy is available, where power, uh, where uh, computing resources are available when they need that. So it doesn't come by itself automatically. So do you see the same issues also in the clients or in the market from your perspective? Yeah, so I think, I think you, uh, you are ahead of your thinking because most of the people are still in operational muddiness to figure out the first steps. You are a, a bit ahead. Uh, let me uh, go to the first point, the profiling. Um, I don't think the profiling is so important. I think the second part is much more important is the patterns that you have. What are design patterns you have, how you're going to use that and how you make that auto scale or scale to zero or uh, and do that in relation to the data graphic discussion. 
because uh, you can make a stateless application uh, scale easily, uh, but if it needs to run at a remote location where it has a network connection that's not smart enough to get to the data, it's pointless anyway. So that's where the, the uh, that's where I revert the design and, and then go into the profiling. You start with the design and you make a, have to make a proper design. The developer has to figure out uh, a sane way to do that. It's, uh, it's not smart to, so, so there's ways to, for example, use uh, data management solution with caching that can distribute across clouds and then you can run your workload everywhere uh, and you don't know where the actual underlying database is because you distribute your data in a caching layer. So those are design patterns I think that are much needed to, to tackle this because then you can statelessly scale up, scale everywhere or scale to zero, uh, program it in functions or in microservices to be able to uh, to be in line with sustainability goals or performance needs or what metrics you want to have because then you can dynamically do that so that's why i think the the breed software foundation has a big potential because they are doing a lot of the groundwork to to make to to industrialize that so if they could become successful they all describe a lot of the the standards that that people can use to educate software developers and, and make new make the better design patterns to do so and share the best practices for that. And if you have that, then the market will follow. Uh, because if the applications are built that way, uh, all cloud providers will find ways to capture those workloads because that's what everybody wants. And that's what the market will do anyway. So that's a bit how I look at these problems and how they interact with each other. Starting to profile application for cloud deployment right now is useful, but not so much. Because I think you better start with designing it for the cloud, and I said, and, and the things like the the, uh, the twelve factor manifesto things are still applicable, and also have not just for uh, uh, agile development advantages, but also for building in sustainability uh, functions or uh, performance and scaling functions. You you mentioned also a little bit before about the. Uh, Green Software Foundation. My, uh, I'm a bit skeptical, and I told them one thing. So uh, in in cloud, we have the PUE, yep. the KPI, which was badly misused to show that the data centers are uh, energy efficient, so to speak. But uh, they they had the excuse not to do enough to make the contents of the data center also yep. energy efficient, and with the SCI, so the the the, the software carbon intensity. I see the same. Uh, it's a new start split. It's a new split incentive. That is defined at this level, yep. and I think uh, bright minds and new talents like you guys should uh, should think of more critical thinking and contribute to this type of uh, uh, KPIs measures that are being adopted potentially massively because there is no alternative and the notion is attractive really not like to have it misused like the PUEs. Yeah, so that's, that's also why VMware is in the GSF. Right? Like, I, like I said, you do software engineering, but you gotta know something from, from the hardware to act, act effectively use it and, and get everything out of it. And I think that's the part that we are looking for in the uh, GSF to contribute also to make the bridge uh, through the abstraction layer to what's, what's the entire stack to, to not have a another split incentive or a energy star rating or whatever. Uh, Are there more questions? Uh, one, then last one. Yeah, we are we are guilty of greenwashing in that in that aspect. So I'm, <laughs> I'm making that pretty clear from from the get go. But um, I, I wanted to start with that as a as an eye opener. What our impact has been, and how tangible it is. There's a report that I can share, and it's on the internet. It's done by uh, by IDC, I think, that uh, tracks all the the uh, the 
the server buying and from all the customers worldwide. And they did all the research and they came up with the formulas to calculate that and uh, how, how we did that. So we didn't, uh, it, so it wasn't they say ain't. Uh, we made sure that it was uh, scientifically uh, uh, underpinned. Well, it's still a hypothesis, but you, because you can never know what people would have done if, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I go along with your claim that the, the, that the claim of emissions avoided is greenwashing, it is, uh, but it was to start uh, conversation and the opening uh, and, and dive more into what we actually are doing to, to change. Yeah, it's been it's been store uh, compute, but also storage virtualization has been taking into effect there as well, um, and of course the the number of servers that people bought uh, for running applications before and and then after, and that's not a one on one relationship. That not every virtual machine uh, is a physical server that people would have bought. They wouldn't have bought thousand servers where they now where they now have twenty. So there there's. Uh, that's market analysis that, that they've done uh, for that to come up with uh, with that claim. Um, but if you look at what what uh, it's been done, if I, I know when I started, the PG&E, the uh, American California uh, grid operator, was giving uh, customers money, uh, subsidiaries, to buy VMware software. Why did they do that? Because then they the footprint of those data centers would shrink enormously. And they had could delay the investments in the energy grid that they all, uh, else had to make. So for them, it was a pretty clear use case. It was cheaper for them to subsidize data centers to virtualize than to invest in, uh, in, in putting more copper in the ground and investing in their grid. Uh, so, but uh, I'm happily to share the, the report on how we came up with this uh, formulas in it, which I nearly understand. So. Uh, I'm not claiming to be able to give you a fully tight answer, but I have the data to back it up. Okay, give it the time. I, I am afraid we have to break here. No, this, I think it's a great natural, natural break for uh, for this. Thank you again for giving this lecture. Very interesting.